Rachel, you want any breakfast, you better come down here. Okay. Uh-oh. Arthur, do you have your driver's license? It's nothing to it. It's like a big video game. <laughs> One, two, two. That's it. We're right here on a heading of 120. We'll maintain this course until we get here, just on the northwest corner of the bank. Just before these shoals, we'll make a I course. I know what shoals are. The shallow water. Just before these shallow waters, we'll make a course change and come down through this channel. We'll anchor for the night somewhere down here. Is that okay? That's great. The humpbacks could be feeding anywhere along the bank. How long until we reach the shoals? Let's see. That's, uh... 50 miles. And we're doing a steady... It's funny. What is it? Well, I thought we were going a little faster than that. But at five knots, that's another 10 hours. What's a knot, Grandpa? A knot is a measurement of speed, CT. One knot is one nautical mile per hour. Hmm. Is there a problem? Well, these shoals are really very tricky waters, and I'd just as soon get through that channel before dark. Excuse me. I'll make my own, thank you. Hey, Captain. You plotting our course? I don't feel good. Must be all that fresh air. Holy cow, it says there are unexploded depth charges here. What if we hit them? Not likely. They're pretty deep. See these numbers? They're depths. Those explosives are 126 fathoms down. How deep is that? Well, a fathom is six feet. So that's, um... 756 feet of moving water. Arthur, you don't look so good. You better get up on deck. Oh, wow, it's so shallow here. And dangerous, too. These are wrecks. Arthur, get up on deck. Here, Arthur. Take a big bite of this. Peanut butter, bananas, raisins, and chocolate sauce. Rachel? I could add anchovies, Arthur. Rachel, that was a rotten thing to do. I know, but it'll feel a lot better now. Well, that's one. Am I gonna get sick too, Grandpa? Probably. What about you? No, I only get sick on land. This thing keeps crashing. It's blinking out on me. Rachel, take this stopwatch. When I say mark, you start it. When you see this piece of bread, even with this pin, stop it and give me the time. Mark! 4.9. 
How fast are we going? You know that trick? My dad taught me. Five seconds, about six and a half knots. Something's wrong. Miss Abrams, what does the echo sounder read? Around 21 fathoms, but I don't trust it. It's been flat for a long time. Sally Ruth, I'll take the wheel. Rachel, go get Ramon. Tell him to bring up the lead line. It's on those shelves just forward of the galley. And hurry it up. What is that thing, anyhow? It's an echo sounder. It measures how deep the water is under the boat. How does it do that? Well, it sends sound waves down to the bottom and then times how long it takes for them to come back up. So that's a picture of the bottom? Well, sort of. It should be, but this part's too flat. It should look more like this. Where's Ramon? I told you to get Ramon. I can do this. I've done it lots of times. OK, but hurry it up. What are you doing? I'm measuring to see how deep the water is. I thought it was a machine to tell how deep it is. There is, but I guess he doesn't trust it. Uh-oh. Two fathoms! Into the wind. Do you want me to take another? No. Ramon! Ramon! Get the sails down fast and get the anchor ready. What's wrong? We've got electrical problems. Instruments are all misreading. They've been going faster than this thing says. Further than I wanted. On the shores? Will the ship fix it? It's possible. I'll get a fix with the RDF to find out. Won't that be wrong, too? No. It's got its own batteries. What's wrong? Well, we're just a little lost, that's all. Lost? You feeling well enough to help? Sure, if it'll get us found. This is a radio direction finder. You tune in a radio beacon and the antenna tells you what direction it's in. You hear how that signal gets loud and soft as I rotate the unit? Uh-huh. When the signal is weakest, it means that this part, the antenna, is pointing directly at the beacon. This bearing is 285 degrees. I'm gonna go below and tune in a different beacon. You rotate that unit until the signal gets weakest, then read the bearing from the compass on the top. You got it? I think so. I mean, I know so. There's the second beacon. That's good, Arthur. What's that bearing? Three, three, four. Three, three, four, Grandpa. This is the bearing to the first beacon, 285. This is the one you just gave me, 334. Where they intersect is our position. Right there on George's shoals. That's good. No, that's bad. Out of the way. Miss Abrams, come to 270 degrees. We'll get off the shoals and drop anchor. We're on the shoals. We've got an electrical problem, too. Let's get that mainsail down. Get that boom in the gallows. Let her go. We'll anchor here for the night. We'll head for port in the morning. Well, I guess it can't be helped. I'm sorry, you guys. We have to go back. Can't sell without instruments. I knew it. Who told you you could go down there? I think I found the problem. You don't touch any of the equipment on this vessel without checking Captain with me Grenville. first. 
He does know about electricity. His father's an electrician. Okay. Show me. Somebody's put a piece of copper tubing in instead of fuse, and you've got a short somewhere. That could cause a real fire down here. If you've got the right tools, I think we could fix it. Let's give it a try. Grandpa, if we can't fix it, can I go back to Ohio? CT, you and me got this whole summer to get through, no matter what happens. So stay out of the way. See if you can find that short. I think I can fix these contacts. Will do. Candlelight dinner, anyone? <sighs> I'm not even hungry. Gotcha. The electric wind shorted out, so I disconnected it. Let me see that meter. Looks good, Arthur. Let's give it a try. Kid knows what he's doing. Way to go, Arthur. You saved the day. Connected here. You home, sick? I'm like it here. Ceiling's dumb. I can't look with you. I don't like it here. Ceiling's dumb. They said Grandpa wanted to see me. They said I could help him, but it's not true. I don't know anything about ceiling, and he doesn't want to see me. Titi, your grandpa really loved you. He just have to help a giant. Sure does. I'll show you something, okay? Yeah, bam. Bam. Come on, try it. Bam. Yeah. We are bam. Yeah. Yeah. Tomorrow, CT. Where else? <laughs> I better go down, okay? why a 15-year-old is driving a car. Well, I'm not really 15. I mean, I am when I play Rachel Fairbanks on The Voyage of the Mimi, but when I play me, I mean, when I am me, Mary Tanner, I'm 20 years old. I've come to the Lamont Doherty Geological Observatory outside New York City to learn a little bit more about the ocean bottom. My host is Dr. Kim Castens. She's a marine geologist who helped us be accurate and realistic when we made the voyage of the Mimi. She specializes in making maps of places no one is likely ever to go. Three miles under the ocean. What's this? Oh, this is um, 
Oh, a model of the seafloor, just off from where we are, just offshore from where we are. Oh. The green part's land, and New York, this area is New York City, uh -huh. New York Harbor there. It, this is all underwater? Yeah, this all the all blue the part blue? is the bottom of the ocean. Oh. And it gets gradually deeper the farther you go away from shore. Mm. Oh, so the different colors are different depths. Right? Yeah, the lightest colors of blue are in the shallowest water. And then the darker shades blew down there are deeper and deeper water. What is this edge? That's the continental slope. Turns out that pretty much everywhere in the world, with a few exceptions, as you start at shore, it goes out real gradually. Mm -hmm. That gradual flat part is called the continental shelf. Oh. And then when you get to about 200 meters of water, it drops off real steeply. And the steep part's called the continental slope. It looks like a canyon to me. Yeah, there's a canyon there. That's Hudson's Canyon. It's carved right down into the continental slope. So it's just, it's like the Grand Canyon, huh? Yeah, in fact, it's about the same size as the Grand Canyon. And that's about a, a mile About a mile, mile deep. deep. Yeah, yeah. Wow. I used to think the ocean was kind of simple. Water as far as the eye could see and a flat sandy bottom. But from what Kim told me, it's a lot more complicated than that. Not only are there canyons, but mountains, cliffs, hills, valleys, just about everything you'd find on dry land. Well, you can't tell much about the bottom of the ocean from this map. No, no. This is exactly the kind of map that was on the wall in my sixth grade classroom that got me so frustrated because if you look at this map, 70% of it, all the part that's water, is just blue with uh -huh. no detail at all. Um, and I got curious about what was, what was going on in the blue part. And that's mm -hmm. sort of why I stumbled into marine geology in the first place. But this is a better map. This was made by oh, um, wow. oceanographers. This map shows what's really on the bottom of the ocean instead um, of solid blue. There's the Hudson Canyon. Yeah, right yeah, exactly. See, there's a whole bunch of canyons that come down the, the, shell, the yeah, slope, the just thing. like Hudson Canyon. This bathymetric place. map shows yeah. that there are actually whole mountain yeah, ranges mountains under mountains thousands of feet of water. Mountains. Mountains as big as any on dry land, bigger even. Most of us know about the biggest underwater mountain of all, but we don't think of it as a mountain. It starts at um, 6,000 meters water depth and comes all the way up to 4,000 meters above the water, so that's 10,000 meters total. We think of this mountain as an island. It's Hawaii. That's so strange to me to have a, a whole state is a mountain. It's a string of mountains. They're all these, yeah. these separate mountains, but that's all it is. Just the very, it's not even a string of mountains. It's just the tops of tops, each mountain. The tops yeah. of the mountains. You get about a third of this mountain sticks up above water. Yeah. When you think of it that way, that makes Hawaii a bigger mountain than Mount Everest. Well, where's the lowest point? It's in the Mariana Trench, and it's 11,000 meters deep. That's uh, nearly seven miles deep. Seven miles straight down. But it isn't all mountains and valleys. Kim told me the flattest places on Earth are also on the ocean bottom. Thousands of square miles, absolutely flat. Some of the places on this map are just scientific guesses about what it's like there. The only way to get an idea of what's on the bottom is to sail a ship over it and measure the depth. Kim spends about two months a year on oceanographic ships, sailing back and forth over areas they want to map with greater detail. They make echo sounder measurements of the seafloor below and sometimes send cameras down to take pictures of small areas. This is an echo sounder record of the seafloor. Mm -hmm. It's like, uh, remember the echo sounder that you had on the, on the Mimi? You know the way that works when you draw a picture. If this is the bottom of the ocean down here and here's the sea surface up here, yes. and Mimi or in this case, the oceanographic ship is, is moving across the sea surface like that. And it sends down a pulse of sound that goes down from the ship and bounces off the seafloor, and it comes back up to the sea surface. And you measure the time that it takes to make that round trip, and the time tells you how far away the seafloor is. After the ship has zigzagged across an area, they end up with an echo sounder strip showing the bottom, directly under the ship's path. The ship hasn't been over every square inch, or even every square mile, so the places in between the course lines have to be filled in. Kim showed me how to do this, to get what's called a contour map of the ocean bottom. First, we had a computer make a drawing of the ship's course. Next, she read depths from the echo sounder strip and I wrote them in where they belonged along the course line. Time of day, 
I could tell where they belonged because she read the time of day for each measurement, and the times were already marked on the course line. Once all the numbers were written in, Kim had me draw lines connecting the places where the depth was the same. These are called contour lines, or lines of constant depth. Yeah, that's really good. Look at that. <laughs> hey, hey. Well, let's see. What I, I find maps like this hard to look at, so what I would probably do at this stage is color it in just to make it easier for me to that, see. That's a great idea. Yeah. And well, it's traditional to make the shallowest places in bright colors. So okay. Here. Okay. Well, then 2600 would be the shallowest place. That's and right. this is yeah. going up. This is a plateau, mm -hmm. isn't it? Yeah. Okay. It's, it's the highest place in the, the highest place. area. Yeah. Okay. 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 Yep. So just color the whole thing in? That's it. Okay. Go ahead. It looks great. I think it looks really neat. It took forever, but the results were well worth it. Not only did the contour map look beautiful, but it became clear to me what a useful tool it is in showing marine geologists a picture of the ocean bottom. I was in for a surprise when Kim showed me just how little of the bottom we had mapped. Yeah, and the place that we just drew is right in there, and it's about that big. Oh, you're kidding. No, I'm serious. It's about that big. Oh, so my God. All that work, you, you know, five days of ship work and the whole morning and making the map, and we now understand the piece that's about that big. We went to another room where Kim showed me some videotapes of the area we had just drawn. During the cruise, when they took the echo sounder measurements, a camera was towed behind the boat. They tried to keep the camera sled yeah. just oh, a few feet off the bottom, 6,000 feet down. Ooh. It is totally dark down there so the bright camera lights didn't shine very far. Well, if you can see all this stuff, why, why do you do all the depth sounding? You're just seeing a tiny area, and you can only carry, drag the camera sled at about one mile in an hour. And this view that you're seeing is only about this far. It's only, you know, a few meters across. Yeah. It's not, so you'll it's, never cover the whole ocean yeah, this way, never. You know, I thought we were covering such a small space just on the Echo Center, and this would be... This is even smaller. It's yeah. 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 smaller. A lot of land it's frustrating not to be able to see more of the ocean bottom at once. But a colleague of Kim's has come up with an exciting solution to that problem. His name is Bill Haxby. Uh, I've been explaining to Mary how you make a bathymetric map, and we were working in a small part of the world, and I wanted to give her some idea of how you could look at the whole ocean at once. Come to the right place. In fact, I was just working on a fairly large section of the world right here. If you'd like to sit down, I could explain something about the about what I'm doing. What I'm working with is a, a data set that was collected by satellite that actually measured the elevation of the sea surface. With the help of the satellite and a computer, Bill has developed a brand new way of seeing whole landscapes beneath the waves. He maps the ocean bottom by looking at the surface. That's right, the surface. Now what I'm working with is actually not uh, seafloor depths, but uh, variations in gravity over the oceans. The ocean isn't as flat as it looks. Even on a calm day, there are actually gentle hills and valleys on the surface created by mountains and canyons on the ocean bottom. These rises and dips on the surface are caused by differences in the Earth's gravity field. Over a sea mountain, there's a little more gravity because of its larger mass. The extra gravity pulls the water and piles it up over the mountain, leaving dips over the canyons and trenches. You can't see these bumps by eye because the biggest variations are only about 20 feet and they're spread out over many miles. Bill used a satellite called CSAT to detect the bumps in the ocean. The satellite had a radar device that worked a lot like a depth sounder. It beamed radio waves to the ocean surface and timed how long it took them to bounce back. The satellite's orbit carried it over every ocean. All Bill gets from the satellite is a bunch of numbers, but he's programmed a computer to turn those numbers into a kind of picture or image of the seafloor. Now, for the first time, scientists can get a general picture of large ocean bottom features everywhere on Earth, even where oceanographic ships have never been. Looking at the computer maps was like having the oceans drained. 
With Bill's images, they've already discovered huge mountains under the sea that no one ever knew about before. The most interesting area, that is in terms of the number of new features which have been discovered from this map, is, is this area south of Africa. Here, let me zoom out. We're going to zoom into a, an area about that size right there. And you can see that it's an area characterized by some very dramatic topo topography. Mm -hmm. That's right. Those are mountains. Those, that's a mid-ocean ridge, fracture zones. There are uh, a lot of seamounts and plateaus, trenches and valleys. Mm -hmm. There are three enormous seamounts right in the middle of this plateau, uh -huh. which have never been mapped before. These mm -hmm. are mountains probably uh, three to 5,000 meters in height uh, um, of an elevation that rivals Mount Fuji, some of the, the more dramatic mountains on Earth, on the continent. Wow. Now, I could give you a present. We, because these features have, uh, have never been named, we could probably name them anything we want. Who knows? Okay. Maybe a whole stick. Pick a name. So why don't we, we call this the, the Mary Seamount? <laughs> you can call this the Kim Seamount. Uh, I won't be too modest. I'll call this the Bill Seamount. <laughs> well. The next time I'm out on the ocean, I'll be wondering what kind of landscape lies beneath me. And thanks to people like Kim and Bill, I could probably find a map that would tell me. Still, at this point, we have better maps of the moon's surface than we do for most of the Earth's surface. The blue part. Mm -hmm.